co-founder, CEO, Matt, how are you? I'm awesome, Jeff. Awesome to be on here with you, man. I've listened to so many of your podcasts and it's, uh, it's nice to be sitting in the seat, you know, with, with you this, this time. Yeah, no, it's good, man. This is, this is fun. This is, uh, one of the people I've known a long time. I got a lot of respect for also invested, you know, being transparent. I am, I am biased. I am on team cash live. I like it. I love what's going on. I love the concept and it, it's, it's nice to see it doing well, moving, uh, quickly. And I don't even know what to say. It's, it's got over what, a thousand concurrence. Give us a little bit of let, let's, I want to revisit your career. I want to do all that, but give me some quick highlights on what's happening. What is Cash Live? I'm going to show on the street, screen if you guys haven't heard about it, but tell me a little about what it is and what's been going on with it recently. Love it. So, uh, Cash Live is a very fast, uh, fast paced game for, for mobile. It's all in our fold. It's a poker game that uh, you get dealt two cards. It's a, it's a bit of an alteration on the traditional Hold'em game. You get, a, you get dealt two cards, you get a see the flop for free and then it's decision time you basically go all in or fold there's no anti there's sorry there's no blinds there's only antis so players make their decision all at once and this way we keep it very very casual very easy for players to play um all in or fold you can kind of see up there you got the live host um that's calling out the action so it's, it makes it feel like you're you know playing this game that's like on tv um or part of one of those televised final tables or something like that that you see. So, um, you know, we keep it fun. We keep it fast. We keep it very easy and it's free to play and players can win real cash. So uh, it's basically a free roll that happens twice a day, seven days a week, uh, 6 p.m., 9 p.m. Eastern. And uh, yeah, man, that's a little bit of insight. We got over, we're averaging, averaging over 1,100 players a game right now, which is uh, which has been awesome. So 11,000 concurrence and um, they're all fighting through the prelims to try and make the final table. And if they make the final table, that that poker host that you saw in that video turns into a poker commentator. And now it's like, okay, we got Jeff in seat one. We got Matt in seat two. We got Damien in seat three. We got Jenny in four. All right, let's play down to a winner. And this whole thing is done in 20 minutes or less. That's awesome. And yeah, no, it's very, it's very cool. You know, taking a the swipe left, right, kind of like the Tinder fun from back in the day. Not that we would do that. We're married now and whatever, but you know, the, the kind of fun and fast, easy it's light it's it's just a good you know if you like poker there's not too much thought all in fold what are some i guess strategic things about it because i've played i don't know i try to get on if i love i got the notifications on i get the 10 minute warning the minute warning i, I get in there i mixed well, it up i've been playing around with what the right strategy is obviously it's tricky because you only get three folds yes. so you got to you got to use that wisely what what is i mean is there actually like a math thing solved though to make the final fold but then like what is the strategy to get there because you got to totally. you, so you can't fold much 100 percent, Dave. yeah you can't fold much you're totally right on that one you don't have to go all in every hand you can afford to use probably one fold and still make the final table and what we've done to kind of change things make things a little um you know make those folds a little more valuable is we've added more players per table in the early going so now we have three players three players four four five we kind of uh five five we cap out at five players per table um at least for now because it looks visually the best and this way you can you know kind of use your phone like this and not you know kind of turn your phone more on the the horizontal way um keeping people being able to like you know use their phone the way it's designed so uh um so yeah you can use one fold uh, i'd say any pair for sure get it in there um, you know, if you're, we have well, the way that we're doing it right now is you have five final tableists and then you have 180 min cashers. So, um, you know, if you're going for the min cash, which yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's whatever. Um, but going for the final table. Yeah. You want to be getting those chips in any, any pair, any, any draw, um, decent draw. Like, you know, if you have five, two on four, six King, you know, that's maybe not the best, maybe you could use one of your folds there, but besides that, you know, get those chips in there and, and hope you hit. Very cool. Yeah. And, and is, uh, is there, I guess when you, when you look at this from a perspective of poker, it makes a lot of sense. Is this something with other games, other, like what, what's sort of the plan right now in terms of, is it just focus on this? What, like, how do you grow from here? Because I, I, I would imagine you're relatively happy with the success. There's been, I've seen a lot of promotion on it. People seem to like it. The feedback's been good. What is something that you're focused on going to this point? Cause the hard part, I know how hard it is to do business 
type things. I've been sort of at the beginning. I got some people involved. Like there's there's a pretty pretty strong list of names that have some backing and some. Uh, I don't know if we want to. We, we don't have to blow up people's business or it's private. But there's some people who've got uh, sweat in the game. A lot of people love this concept and this idea. How do you grow from here? How do we? How do you make this become even better based on what you've seen so far? Hundred percent. Uh, so yeah, Jeff. I, I'll say first off that you've been, you know, an instrumental part of the team from the from the early going and really helping us grow out our our network of of poker players. Um, we don't have to drop names, but four out of the five, four out of the top five World Series of Poker all time money earners are investors in Cash Live. Rule out who you will. And uh, also uh, combined earnings, we have one hundred and fifty million in tournament winnings between the the all the Cash Live investors. So. Um, kind of the who's who. Uh, then we also have, you know, you mentioned Tinder. The former CEO of Tinder is an investor, which is really cool. Um, Snap Inc. is an investor. Um, we are part of the Snapchat Accelerator, which I'm sure we'll dive into at some point. Yeah. And then uh, uh, the the Paradise Poker founders are investors. Um, one of the VP of product or the v, the senior VP of product at Reddit is an investor as well too. So yeah, we got a really a lot of really cool names. Lightspeed Ventures. Um, yeah, it's been this amazing journey and, uh, yeah, a big part of that, you know, you've been a story from the very beginning, man. So, uh, uh, nothing but love and gratitude for, for you being part of this team as well, too. I love it. Can you tell me a bit about the idea? How did this come up? Whose idea was it? Was it yours? Was it a partner? Was it a friend? Is it some other game or something that sparked you? Where did you say, you know what, this is a thing and I'm going to, I don't know, would you say you got out of poker for this or were you kind of already segueing out of playing? Um, we're going to dive in your poker crew, which in itself is worthy of a podcast, of course, <laughs> which we're doing. But the business side is kind of, you know, it's fun. It's it's fresh and it's interesting. But we'll definitely talk about your your run. Winning the bracelet, November 9er, pretty strong to have on a resume, especially for not playing that that much, you know, or at least that much anymore. So what, what got you out of poker? Was it this and where did this idea come from? So it wasn't this, um, it was my idea. I'll, I'll say that first off, I did partner with my co-founder that um, was in mobile gaming for about eight years and he didn't want to do mobile gaming anymore. Um, the two of us met in 2018, uh, just after I had my, my first daughter and, uh, and was like, look, I, I want to get something in that back into something that I'm passionate about. I was super passionate about poker. I left poker to kind of follow my entrepreneurial path. I, I did a bunch of different things, man. I did, you know, network marketing at one point I did, uh, um, I own trailer parks. We had 155 tenants um, in two different trailer parks in Indiana. Um, I owned a That's house. An interesting business. Uh, I actually, my my wife's friend got showed us some decks and stuff on it, and there was. It's a pretty, it's a, it, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Is that, is that something you still do or you did or a little? You I, did. I did. Yeah. It's same thing. Um, Jeff, like I felt like I wasn't super passionate about it and I wanted to just dump everything that I wasn't super passionate about. I just want to like get completely out. I don't want to be, I'm not great. Um, similar to poker. Like I, I did, uh, I was really good at no limit hold'em. So I, I like at cash and, and tournaments, but once I started spreading out in some of the other games, PLO, et cetera, it like I found myself too spread thin and I wanted to be very good in one specific thing. So um, for me in poker, that was no limit hold'em for me in business. You know, that's now been cash live. But at one point I had trailer parks. I had um, I had my shack shine business, which is basically like house detailing, like window washing, gutter cleaning, pressure washing. That was a crazy story as well, too. Um, but uh, but I did all of these things from basically 20, pretty much 2013 onwards up to about 2018 before i found cash live and then I, once i once i founded cash live i just dropped everything and said uh look i want to be all in on uh on this vision that i have for this product i think the most exciting thing to me is that and what, well, what you're saying i love it because like i'm kind of the opposite where i do a lot of different things and Dude, you so definitely do but and 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 it's good and bad, right? You can you can go that like clear intention, one thing, and and then you can also go the other like Gary V type route where you're just like, all right, I'm gonna do a little of everything. And and it, trust me, there's there's merits to both. And I think you know we can probably say we've gone insane at different times either way, right? It's like you you, you go you put your heart into something and maybe it's harder than you thought, or there's a lot of hurdles, or maybe you feel some stuff out, and that also can be a bit you know a bit overwhelming to just do a little of everything. So what what has been uh, I guess the question I would say is from the time you started to where you are now, what have been some of the biggest learnings and, and obstacles, hurdles uh, in this business? Because when you look at the cash live, it seems pretty straightforward, right? It's all in your fold. You, you, you put the stuff there, you figure out the software, make sure it's right. But you know, then you got, you got to have the hosts, you got to time things right. There's API, there's 
applying for Google, App Store, of course, the Snapchat Accelerator we're gonna talk about, which is a major deal and what that really means. And it is something to be very proud of itself. But what have been some of the biggest, like, wow, like people at home wouldn't think that this is so crazy or what have been the hardest parts to make this like get off the ground and be successful? Yeah, that's true, man. I, um, one thing as a, a CEO and founder, <clears throat> You know, we talk about kind of being like narrowed and focused on what you're doing, but as a as a CEO and founder, kind of building up a business, you kind of have to be good at everything. Like, you can't be just good at like you know fundraising or sales or you know recruiting. Like, it's like they're like on and on. There's like legal accounting. Like, there's just so many different things and a lot of things I'm not great at, but I, I like lean on other people to do so. And and they don't just show up the first day you create a company. You know what I mean? Like, you have to like go out and find these people. You got to, you know, you got to bring them onto your team. You got to sell them on your vision, not just investors, but you got to sell your team on, on coming. Like why should they leave a job that might be paying them more, uh, you know, sometimes 20, 30% more to join a startup that has no, you know, like leave a game, leave like an EA sports and come work for, for you when, you know, there's no certainty in what things are going to look like in six months, 12 months, 18 months, you know? So, um, that it's all part of that, man. It's uh, it's learning how to, um, you know, find the right people. That's a huge thing. Like, you know, not finding the right people um, to join your team just costs so much time and money and energy. Um, so I, I really don't want to bring anyone else on the team that I just don't absolutely love being around uh, anymore. Like, I think that's uh, that's one thing I've really learned in the last little while. Um, you know, there's a lot of late nights and stuff like this, and and you as a father as well too know that that. That's challenging when you start blending in like the whole, you know, running a business while also, you know, dealing with family time and finding separation between the two. It's like there's a lot of overlap there. And, uh, you know, we have one of our games that is at 6 p.m. Pacific. Like that's right during our dinner hours. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like uh, it's like my, my wife is like, uh, it's like, you know, do we have to see every single game? And the answer is no. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find that balance, man. But you know, finding the balance for me is, is, uh, is very, is very challenging, but, uh, it's been a, a fun ride, man. It's, it's, uh, it's been awesome. I, I love what we're doing. We're basically like, we're creating a game, like a mobile app. It's like a game on your phone. And at the same time, we're creating like, we're, I'm, I'm a TV producer as well too. Like, it's like, I'm producing little television shows and also creating a game that people interact with at the same time. It's, it's, it's like, for me, it's so much fun. But wow, like, you know, very challenging as well, too, because you got to balance those different components and building it. And and I guess from a perspective of being a poker player, having that have, having that experience on your belt, understanding what action is, variance, what all the things that you want to feel and, and do when you're competing. How do you feel that Cash Live encompasses that feeling? Like when you look at the product currently, is it at 100? Is it like there's stuff with the design? feel speed of play like are is it stuff that because obviously what you visualize and what you want it's not necessarily always so easy to do exactly or there's reasons why or you have to do less. so like how frustrating is that that experience and and i guess where is it now to where you want it to be and how has that process been to get it there with like the design and, and tech process because that's not what we are right you're not a technical yeah. designer you know what you see you like you have some other apps or games you play and maybe you want to try to mimic or replicate but it's not you're not the one able to actually do it so you just kind of tell what you want and others give feedback and it happens. So give me kind of an answer on that. How, how, where is it now? Where do you want it to be? And, and are there, is that something that's going to be constantly adjusted as well? hundred percent. Yeah. It's constantly, constantly adjusting. Like I even look at, you know, our hosts that the way that they are interacting with, you know, reading our back, our basically the system to be able to like co do commentary on the game, you know, that has changed and evolved so much over like the last 18 months. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been crazy, but you know, you don't realize all these different things. There's, there's a, ba there's backend software. So basically the guys that you pretty much as, as a user never see what they do, but they're running all, you know, they're doing everything in the background to make sure that things work the way that they're supposed to making sure that, you know, uh, a flush doesn't beat, uh, or sorry, a flush doesn't beat a full house on, on the river. There's all these little, all these little things and making sure the chips are all going in the right in the right places and all this stuff. So all these things that you just like, you know, oh yeah, you know, poker stars, how, how difficult can that be that, you know, they build a software, they plug into some kind of poker, you know, system and it just works. That's not how it works. It's like, you know, there's so much that goes on and goes into that. Uh, then there's the front end side of things. That's like everything you touch and feel on the app 
and make sure that um, that's all working uh, working properly. Then there's like our dashboards that we build for the host to be able to use. Like it's it's crazy. And you know, being a non technical founder, you know, and learning all this stuff. And and again, like I'm I'm just scratching the surface on on what uh you know what you really understand about the whole systems. But just having the right people in place. Um, you know, my chief product officer Murray uh, has been in social casino for eight years. He's been in gaming for twenty plus years. Um, he's my right hand man. He, he's the guy that can kind of speak to all these different components of the app and of the product and stuff like this. And without being able to lean on him the way that I do, uh, and my co-founder, Sam, who's been in, in gaming for so long, uh, it'd be, it'd be super challenging for a, a poker player to step off the street and say, I'm going to build an app. I'm going to build a poker app that, you know, that's going to, um, go to the moon. And, uh, you know, to answer your other question of where are we now versus where we're going, um, we right now are at V1, you know, we're, we're, it's taken a long time, almost three years to get to V1, but like, how are we going to start integrating more things right now? We're on iOS in Canada in us and Mexico. So North America only, but how do we spread that globally? Then how do we, you know, also get onto Android, which, you know, we're very close to doing that. We're the last couple steps of red tape with the Google play store, but we should be on Android the next couple of weeks, which is amazing. Opens up to, basically everybody, which is great. We're not segmenting half the um, half the community saying, no, you can't play. We're saying like, look, everybody can play in the regulated jurisdictions. So, or not regulated jurisdictions, in the jurisdictions that uh, we are currently in right now. But, um, but also finding out that like, if you build an app, you can literally just flip a switch and go into different countries. Like tomorrow, if we wanted to go into whatever, Zimbabwe, you know, like, like, you know, yeah, UK, like just all these different places, Brazil, we can literally just flip a switch and we're, we're in there, which I obviously, I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, so, but at the same time, you don't want to roll these things out too quickly. Um, you know, our servers are based in North America. How's that going to react in, in countries around the world? So, you know, you slowly build these things out as much as I want to push the growth. Uh, we got to work on that, but yeah, down the road to, to, you know, um, concise answer your question. We're not just going to be poker. We're going to be blackjack tournaments, bingo tournaments, roulette tournaments. Um, what about Pai Gao? We have a, I have a super VIP legend friend, one of my very <laughs> close friends in the chat, who's a Pai Gao specialist, and he knows and prides himself on Pai Gao. Is there going to be a Pai Gao cash live? Is that even a possibility? Have you thought of it? Is that in the plans? It's it's definitely been thought of. That along with like Teen Pati as well too, like huge in India. Um, all these things are on the table. Uh, it just depends on you know, how quickly we can get there. And, you know, being part of a startup, you you raise money so you can scale quicker. As soon as you've basically figured out something, you take that something into the marketplace for investors, you bring on investors, then you, you know, uh, take that money that they've brought up, they've, they've invested in the company, go find more people, more developers, more people on the team, grow the team, you know, take that, you know, grow, grow things faster. And, uh, and then you're, it's a cycle in that way. Right. Do you know what I mean? I love it. Let's talk about Snapchat because it's fun. It's sexy. It's that company uh, kind of dove a bit. And then the stock, is if you see what did, just the price came back, kind of refound itself. It's, it's complicated now. Twitter, Instagram. I saw one of the funniest things I ever saw was a, uh, was someone like put like the Excel sheet, you know, like Excel, like Excel has stories now. Like, like, like it's basically like a, a WhatsApp. You can post your stories. Everyone's doing the same shit. Like every social media is like almost the same, but you know, like saying on Excel, they literally like someone's like, Oh, put your, put your, you know, within Excel have it. So like Snapchat's refound itself. It's a big company, successful company, and they have invested in to this product, which is pretty sweet. If you could explain a bit about the accelerator and how prestigious that is and, and what kind of, uh, how many different applicants there were, the process and what that means. I don't know what you're able to share or not, but could you share um, what, what Snapchat's involvement is? 100%. Yeah. So Snapchat um, decided they wanted, or Snap Inc., their parent company in 2018, decided they wanted to like create an accelerator. Um, you know, there's other big, big accelerators that are basically out there, uh, 500 startups. There's, um, yeah, there's just a ton of them that, uh, that are, are, are accelerators. What, the, what an accelerator is or an incubator is, is basically that incubator invests in the company and then they bring you almost most of the time in house to like have you work on a 14 week or, or 10 week, three month, you know, um, program that they're teaching you everything that they can about, about business. So, um, so Snapchat decided in 2018, they wanted to create it 
And their very first one, I think, had like 1,800 companies apply to be part of their first first accelerator. They, they invest 150,000 US dollars and uh, they take a piece of the company and um, and and then you go work with them in, in their in their offices in Santa Monica for the next 14 weeks, meeting some like insanely crazy people. Um, and I'll talk about that in a sec. But in 2019, they did this again. They announced it again. You know, we're like, oh, wow, this is this seems pretty cool. This would be a great you know way to jumpstart cash live. Um, we applied. There are hundreds of companies that 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 applied. We made it into the top 75 for basically video video interviews. We then made it to the next stage, which was 30, uh, 30 people made this like in person um, videos or sorry, in person interviews in uh, L.A. and Santa Monica at the Snapchat headquarters. And then from there, only 10 companies were going to be chosen. And they had a panel of about 15 people, super intimidating, but just so cool to go into the Snapchat office. There's like snap branding everywhere. You go through doors and it's like the ghost shape, which is just so cool. And um, and yeah, like we got a call a couple days later that we were in. So, um, you know, that they were going to invest in our company, that we're going to go, you know, sp spend that summer 14 weeks um, in Santa Monica. Uh, and wow, what a, what an ex experience, you know, sitting down with a co-founder, um, with both co-founders at different points, Evan Spiegel and, um, you know, having him give us feedback on the product, uh, for, for 30 minutes and like meeting with him different times. Uh, he presented on stage for our, our demo day. And then I immediately came up on stage right after him. And I'm like, man, this is so cool. They've now, they're now at 500 million monthly active users, which is just insane. Like that's like what are there seven million seven billion people in the world like that's like what one fourteenth so seven percent of the world is on is on snapchat monthly it's it's it is it is staggering when you think of stuff like this and you think of big businesses and i mean listen myself personally with snapchat i have it i've used it i don't use it daily um there's periods of times where maybe you know have or different whatever but that, like again from a business optic to be able like facebook you said Google, these type of powerful names. When you think about when they start and where they are now, do you ever, do you think like this with cash live? Are you like, Oh, like we have a thousand, you know, per game or 2000 DAUs or whatever, however you call it daily active users. Is that right? DAU. So like yeah, yeah. this type of stuff is like, Oh, okay. And then does that get you like, do you, what do you believe the ceiling is for, for something like a game like this or a platform like this? Cause again, it's not just poker. There's other verticals, there's other ways you could do it. And there's other, you know, maybe even things, you haven't quite thought of yet that like could be used for it or similar type thing with patents and different stuff. So what is the ceiling? Where do you think this could go? I, I really think it, there, there is no ceiling. Like it, it sounds, it sounds crazy, but I don't think that there's a ceiling because um, we've really figured out the live stream tech. And I think that's a big, a big part of it. And we've already had interest from other companies that have, you know, millions of, of DAUs, daily active users that are very interested in us basically incorporating our, what we've learned on the on the on the live stream part of things and the operation side of things and almost creating that for them like we're calling it live as a service and we definitely think that down the road cash live can be that for a lot of big companies because we've really kind of figured that out as well too um but uh but yeah that was absolutely that was you know such a cool uh cool thing to be thinking about but really like we're only two days like the app is live 30 minutes a day, maybe 40 minutes a day right now, Jeff. So it's like, you know, when we build out our studio and we building out more games as well too, like um, there's so many different ways for us to, we, you know, we want to be the scratch and win ticket for your phone, basically. That's what we want to be. Like the the very simple, easy scratch and win ticket for your phone. And, um, and you know, so that's what the product of Cash Live can grow. But the business of Cash Live can grow much beyond that because if we can really keep figuring out the logistics behind this um, this live stream tech and and, and uh, create this amazing experience. Um, you know, we can start doing this for other companies as, as well too. Yeah, it's really really cool. And uh, what uh, I guess would you say with the the current state of poker? What like what is from what is your current amount of poker? Do you ever do you get to play a little bit? I, we're looking at the hand and mob. I got every you know again like I said very. Very, very interesting career. You've had a November 9 on your belt, a World Series bracelet on your belt. We see, you know, no, looks like you haven't really been playing. Obviously, COVID, like, last year, live, but you kind of really weren't playing, even 17. You know, when would you say you officially stopped playing poker? And then, like, when did you, like, move it from, like, you were playing full-time to you're playing somebody yeah. else? So 2015 would, would be that year. If you scroll up, I finished 51st in the World Series main event in 
2015. Um, where does it show? Is it, uh, I don't see it on there right now, actually. Um, yeah, anyway, 20, 2015. Um, yeah, finished 51st in the World Series main event. Um, and uh, yeah, there you go. Um, that was actually the year I had, a, I had a big, big sweat with Cannoli at the final table. And he lost aces to tens. Oh, uh, 30. I remember that year. That is, did, did you play with any of these guys? Any of the, not, I did. Jo awesome. Yeah, Josh Beckley that finished second. Him and I played a, a really crazy hand together where I, four bet pre and then barreled and he got there with like uh, a flush on the river um, with like a, he had a pair and a flush draw, but it was like marginal. Um, if he didn't make that flush on the river and if I like did barrel again, I, I could have got him off it. M my mistake was not four betting big enough. And I, he kind of slipped in there with like, you know, a suited marginal hand. And um, I just moved to the table too. And we were kind of the two big chip leaders, but I had a really bad day six there, my man. And, uh, I often think about that day because I also had 20% of another guy named Jonas Makoff that day. And our equity going into day six was 1.2 million. And uh, um, and Jonas, or my equity, my personal equity between my my stake and, and my stake in him. And unfortunately, Jonas went out in like 70th and I went out in 51st. And we were we both started the day like top 20 of like, you know, 120 or something like that. So, you know, and this was five years after my, me making the World Series main event final table. So it's like, you know, I'm like, man, am I going to do this again? Like it really, it had been done once by, I forget his name to finish ninth two years in a row. Yeah. But, yep. but yeah, but, um, but it would have been like, it would have really kind of shined a light on me of being like, you know, the only guy besides this guy to kind of get there um, again. So I, uh, I had a really bad day yeah, six. In the modern day, right? Cause this guy's in a modern, modern, yeah. In the modern day, like November yeah. nine plus Aaron talk, talk to me a bit about uh, you actually are one of the few poker players that have been on here that didn't final table their first ever event, which is uh, Mark Newhouse. Thank you in the chat. Yeah, Twenty one twenty five, getting it, getting us right on uh, track here. But so I, I looked it. here, and you got eleven. So you didn't final table. That it took you the second time on your Hendamada final <laughs> table because I think that's an interesting stat that people that kind of get hooked or they final table and then they were in poker for a long time. But tell me what you were doing in 2008. Were you grinding online already? You just hadn't played live or did, was, yes. how did you get started in poker? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, um, I did start the way I started with poker was after a sales meeting. Um, I got offered to, I've been playing cards since I was like a young kid at my family cabin, but didn't start playing poker until I was like 19 years old, which lines up for the legal gambling age in Canada, which I think you used to come across the border when you were young as well too, to, to, yeah, to yeah. play casinos. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, so this also was 2003. This is the moneymaker year for me. So it just kind of like really lined things up. Um, but uh, but started playing a little bit of like um, online MT, uh, sorry, online sit and goes and then live cash. But it was started with me was limit poker. So it was like, you know, two, four limit, then a four, eight limit. And then I started playing one, two, no limit um, live. And then I started playing MTTs online. Um, so I got really... I'd say really good, but it took a while for me to get good um, at deep stack poker. Uh, I was always way too aggressive. Like I was always like, you know, constantly trying to bluff. Like I just felt this rush from bluffing people and I needed my friends to basically like harness that and kind of like, you know, okay, we got to dial this down a little bit. One, you know, my, one of my good friends, Ash, um, that, uh, that him and I were poker buddies for, for years, he basically said to me, look, you don't show up. You want to show up a little more like little red, like little red, the wolf from Little Red Riding Hood. You want to wear the, you don't want to be the wolf and show up to the party as the wolf. You kind of want to like, if people think you're the wolf, you got to act a little bit more, you know, not like the wolf. And if you're, because people are going to call you all the time. So you got to kind of, you know, surprise them and like show up with the, the nuts a lot more because people, I'm not a young internet kid anymore, but I used to be, they think you're the young internet kid that's just blasting. So, um, so yeah. So anyway, that, you know, it, no limit. So live cash and MTTs were kind of my, my specialty. And I think those two things kind of came together where they eventually made a perfect um, blend or perfect complement for playing the World Series main event. Because you learn how to play, you know, the 30 big blind and under stacks and the 200 big blind and over stacks. Right. No, that's uh, yeah, that's definitely the what you want to know if you're playing playing tournaments that definitely helps and so you kind of you're live you're messing around here 2008 2009 looks like you go to pca so you're traveling a bit you're doing your thing you get a 20k score uh yeah. which is nice right this is like yeah. a real 2500 
event. It was a big prize up top, you know, get a little experience, go deep. What was that like at that time? How, how important was that? Had you already had a bankroll online and we're doing well and playing and submission or was this still like you were not quite broken out yet? Yeah, 2000, 2008, I was starting to win tournaments online for like, you know, 15K, 20K, 30K, 50K, kind of around that range. So um, online, like Sundays, like didn't matter what family function was going on, I was dropping everything and being sitting in front of a computer from 7 a.m. to midnight, um, just about every Sunday, um, you know, playing live cash like six days a week during during um, during the week. And then online um, Sundays were like my days to just like sit there and grind MTTs. So, and, um, yeah. and, and you you go to the PCA uh, now. All of a sudden, it's January. Like, how into how into poker were you in Jan of 2010? Because I see there was nothing yeah. else. You didn't play until right. it looks like the World Series. So January 2010, take a poker trip. You nothing eventful. You get a min cash. You know it's expensive at the Atlantis, thousand dollars there. Maybe you're playing some online because at that time. Uh, was it still pre Black Friday, right? 2011. So it for, was. For US, so poker was still sort of booming, but you know yeah. it, was, it was in a time. Uh, talk to me then when you go to the World Series. It looks like June 2010. You you have a 1300 cash, a 2k cash, a deep run at the Venetian. You get 13th, a little disappointing probably for 9k. Yeah. And uh, now it's July 5th main event comes around. Like you haven't had a big score. You haven't 20k is your largest score. Couple yeah. runs. What is your feeling about poker at this time? And 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 what do you, like we're? I mean, because this is a big score. You go from from no no big score into the November nine. And November nine, you know, I want to talk about that too because this was now what the year after. I guess they they were doing the November nine at this point. I think it started in two thousand nine. This is yeah. two thousand ten. So I guess first off, tell me what happened in that main event. Were you confident? Were you feeling good? Or were you kind of like, man, poker is like not going great? Or I'm not, am I ever going to get a score? Like, how were you feeling going into that tournament? Like, I really felt so going in that tournament. Another, like, you know, kind of kicker was my dad was diagnosed with stage four throat cancer. Um, and this happened in like March of that year and uh, or no, April of that year that we found out. And like this super healthy guy, professional golfer, um, you know, like this just came out of complete nowhere. And like stage four is like, you know, there's no stage five. Like it's stage it's stage four is the highest you can get. So um, I, I really considered not going down to the world series at all, but he had been so in my corner for many years, like, you know, being a professional golfer himself, seeing those up and downs that, that, that kind of, um, career provides, you know, he really wanted this for me. And he pushed me, he said, look, Matt, there, there's nothing you can do here. Go down the world series, you know, play your heart out, um, and, and do it. And I've been going down to Vegas, um, leading up to that year for about five years previous, we'd rent a house. I'd mostly play cash. I wouldn't play that many tournaments. I mostly just go down and grind Mirage cash and, and uh, Venetian cash and, and things like this. Um, but uh, but yeah, this was kind of my, my year. Like I'd, I'd, you know, leading up to that, I'd had like, I came second in the Sunday warm up for 100K. I um, had had uh, another score of winning the second chance for like 50, um, a few others. Like I probably won 180K over a few months stretch. Uh, decided to stop drinking, um, you know, like earlier there. I'm like, I was really getting my mind focus of how I can, how I can win. I was, I probably watched high stakes poker too, more than anyone on, on the entire planet, um, season five and six, I think. And I'm like, look, I'm going to emulate Tom Dwan. I'm going to go down there and I do everything I can to just like crush these guys. And, um, uh, I won a, a 1K sit and go. I, I uh, you know, one of these things may be frowned upon, but I uh, took me and one other player, my, my good friend said, okay, let's both play this 1K sit and go and we'll just chop it 50 50. And um, uh, he was the first one out and I won the thing outright. Uh, no deals, won it outright. Uh, ended up saddling into the main, um, gave him some, some cash back because there was last longers and stuff like this. And he took a little piece of me, I think 12%. And, uh, and then I sold a little bit more action. I was actually into it for zero. So I, I really felt like, look, this is a little bit of a, a free roll for me. And um, I went in, I was one of the chip, chip leaders in, in, in day one uh, after uh, playing a huge back and forth pot. I was actually all in with a flush draw versus the versus aces. And if I had lost that, I would have been out day one. So this, this goes to show you that like, you know, that definitely plays a role, but I was not all in again after that until the final table. Wow. So like, we're talking like it was eight days back then. So it's like, you know, and, and the, the eighth day went down to 7 a.m. Um, before we finally made the final table. But, uh, but yeah, the next seven days, I wasn't at all in, all in once. I was just cruising with a, a 200 big blind stack and, and uh, um, uh, you know, the one big, yeah, the one big moment for me was the bubble. 
the bubble was a huge moment for me because I played one spot where I had pocket queens against a chip leader at the table and never got shown down. But we ended up going back and forth, back and forth. And the whole table thought I was like this maniac, but really I, I had like the nuts. And from then, nobody wanted to mess with me. I ended up winning 24 of the next 25 hands on the bubble. I just raised every single hand and everybody just folded. And I, I went from being, you know, a high mid stack to one of the top 10 chip, le chip leaders um, on day four. Then, you know, full tilt slapped a patch on me and then I just felt invincible after that. What, and what, what was the, what was the deals back then? And what, what happened with full tilt? So what, what were you offered? How was, how did that go down? Cause this is like the wild west when it's, sponsorships were getting thrown around, they were paying people for per like yeah. side event final tables. It was just crazy. Yeah. Uh, you get 10 K you get 10 K you yeah. like, it's like throwing stuff around back then. What they were doing is they would say, look, um, sign this contract, wear a full tilt patch, the rest of it. If you make the final table, um, you'll get 150 K us. And then you'll also get, anytime you get on a feature table, you'll get money as well too. Any article that's written about you, you get money as well too. So, you know, I think I netted over like 200K or something like that from, from Full Tilt and that, and that deal just for that tournament alone. Um, right, so, and then there's, a, there's if you win it or whatever, right? If you win it or yeah. top three and stuff like that. If you win it, yeah, I don't know if there's top three. I think it was like make the final table yeah. or it was a big jump for making the final table, of course, right? But like 30K, to like jump to like 150 if you made the final table so that bubble was ridiculous but um on, on top of what it actually was in the actual tournament but if you won it it was an additional million bucks well very 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 intense and so you do make the final table what position were you were and what was that like to be in the november 9 because then i mean they don't do anymore so you now you're like get the money up to what they give you 800k is that right they pay you exactly. out your eight eight ninth was 811 so yeah, they, uh, you get that money. And then like when you come, what position were you in to come back when you, when you, when you ended up coming back? So I want to flip to go into the final table against Brandon, Joe, uh, Brandon, Brandon Steven, Steven? Brandon Steven. Exactly. You know, boy, man. He's I know tough finishes and then like tents and big, big spots. He's bubbled the one drops and I know. Stuff, but yeah. So, so you win a flip. What was the hand? Uh, so I just pushed all in with uh, 10 9. I sorry, I reshoved on Joseph Chung, who was opening under the gun with uh, 10 9 of hearts from the cutoff. Just being like, look, these guys are just killing us. Like, I need to make a stand. Um, otherwise, they're just. Wow. Like, 10 9 suited on the main event bubble. You just said F it. For how dude, many blinds? For uh, I shoved like, um, must have been like 17 or something like that. 17. Wow, that's a ballsy shove, man. I know. Like, they're. It, this is the time, like, there was a hand earlier in day eight where uh, Jason Sentai opens button. I three bet big blind with a six off. He four bets, and I five bet jammed um, with a six off. Uh, again, one of these, these, you know, um, this is the way that it was back then. It's like you were, there's all, you're always playing chicken pre flop, and there's a lot of this that kind of went on. That, you know, that, that for sure would be thought of as reckless. It still is pretty reckless today, but I just, I had such a good gut feeling on it um, based on uh, his sizing, how quickly he re-raised. And, um, but anyway, yeah, I just, to me, it's like, look, I'm going to get blinded out of this thing. And I, I'm going to basically go in with like zero chips in this main event final table um, or just be forced in a spot where, that I don't want to be in if I don't make a stand at some point. And I knew Joe Chung, this was the spot that he could open. Like the, that um, Dolan was in the big blind. Duhamel was right beside him. They were the three biggest chip stacks. So it's like, you know, I know back then, like under the gun, like always showed strength and like there weren't a lot of flops being taken at this point. So, um, so he opened under the gun and I'm like, look, this is his spot to open, which is like almost any two because he just thinks he's going to get it through so often. Again, this is six in the morning, six in the morning. They didn't do a, a 3 a.m., 2 a.m. cutoff. This was, you know, maybe even 6.30 in the morning. And uh, I reshoved on him and very next hand, um, Brandon Steven shoves all in for probably like 11 bigs. And I had, uh, whatever, maybe, um, 20 at the time or something like this, or yeah, 20 at the time. And, and, uh, I look down at pocket Queens and I decide to, to go, to go for it with them. And the two of us are, are, you know, side by like, you know, not side by side, but around each other and, and, uh, flop bricks out, turn big bricks out. And like, everyone's just like cheering for, for me mostly, especially at the final table of like, one of the rare situations where it's like you, you know, you feel like you have a team beside you yeah. uh, because they want this bubble badly. Like it's, it's seven, almost seven in the morning now, like, um, and the river breaks out. Huge pay jumps. Yeah. Huge pay jumps. Like just 
like, you know, life changing moments to get to that November nine. And, and I, and I, and I ended up winning it and, uh, just the arms go up in the air. Everyone's cheering. Like it just, yeah, it's crazy. And I just you had the I, Queens and you held, he had ace I, king. I had the Queens and I held. Yeah. Wow. Big, big pot. So, okay. So I'm looking at here, guaranteed 800 K. What were you, what was it like to go home after that? I mean, cause your summer, you know, everyone's you're, you're, yeah, it's crazy. Right. And it's exciting. So you have how long you have like July till November. So what, like, what are you doing in time preparation deals? Like what, what is going, I mean, you got it. It's got it. It honestly, they don't do that anymore. It has to be the greatest feeling to have that oh. locked up in the excitement playing for another 8 million. Like it's just gotta be all time, right? Like you can't Dude. really take the, take the, take the excitement. I, mean, I can't even imagine how exciting that is. That's it. Right. Like I probably got interviewed somewhere between 80 and a hundred times during that, like, you know, local news, ESPN and everyone in between um, poker inside of poker, outside of poker, like everywhere. And um, it was such a cool experience. Uh, and I also won two tournaments um, during my that that four month break. I won the um, uh, the Canadian National Heads Up, uh, or sorry, yeah, the Canadian National Heads Up Championship, um, which was super cool. Uh, and then I won another tournament at Bellagio as well too. Um, uh, it was like a one k rebuy um, back then as well. So and then I think I finished second in another tournament. So I was kind of on a heater in that in that three month break. Um, uh, and really just trying to get in as many reps as I could play to friends a ton. And were you, or were you, um, were you studying a lot? Were you at that point where you, what were you doing to prep or like looking at footage? Like how were you attacking that, that time? I really didn't look at that much footage. Like, cause we like you only had the ESPN moments, right? Like you didn't have the entire tournament that was basically going on. You basically had like the one hour tidbits, um, that they would show and the way that ESPN did it back then is they would break each day down in a, into, I think two episodes and show one episode a week. So even though everybody already knew you were at the final table, they kind of like showed these episodes in day three, day three and a half, day four, day four, you know, and kind of moved it on from there. And, uh, I really didn't get any airtime, I think almost to like day seven or something like this on this tournament. But, um, but yeah, what, what an, what an experience just of like, you know, not a ton of, not a ton of studying but more just like how am i going to get my mental um game there and, and how am i going to like make sure that you know i'm ready for this tournament and this 33 big blind stack and and uh you know one thing i wish i did more of is is just like play out the final table with the same blind structure and things like this with a punch of very competent friends with right. something on the line like even like you know pay out whatever uh like 1500, 1500 to whoever finished first, second, third, and just like let them all free roll to just like basically be in there and play against me. Like if I was to go back again, that's for sure what I would have done. Cause I would, I would want, you know, I would want to really feel what it was like to be in that moment over and over again. I think this is what Martin Jacobson did is he just like played that, that over and over again, that like, how am I going to, you know, what is this going to feel like if I actually win this thing? How long am I going to have to be here? What, you know, what, what is the, what is that all going to be like? And, um, uh, yeah. Shane, just recreate like 40 blinds, 80 blinds, 20, 10, give the stacks. He plays his own, give the friends, you know, or yeah. you have people play and like just deal hands and, and see like how he shakes out and what he does and, and look at spots and then plug in situations. Yeah. That makes 100%. A lot of sense. Like, like literally spend, thir be willing to spend 30, 30 K 40 K or something like this on just like, how do I, how do I recreate this situation as good as possible? Realize that 30 or 40 K back then would be like a very small, that that's less, that's probably like 10% difference. I think it was like 300 K pay jumps for the first few. It's like, that's 10% difference. Like realize that you're going to have to invest money. If you want to make money, eighth place was 800 K first place was, a, was 9 million. Like I'd say, if I could go back again, I would, I would recreate that situation and try and play it over and over. Well, let's watch this hand here and I'm going to mute the volume just to let you talk through it. If, I mean, it's going to be a quick highlight from this, but so this was how tall, tall what th this, uh, how deep into this was this is eight. So one player busted, right? Yes. And so this action happens and there's Duhamel raises. He's got the chip lead, very talented player. Ms. Rocky variant to uh, player flats. And yeah. what are you thinking here? How many, how many blinds did you have when you shoved this? Uh, I had 22 bigs at that point, I think. Um, yeah, I think 22 bigs. And I just looked at Mizraki and, and I just felt like there's no way he he doesn't re-raise here um, against Wait, Duhamel with a big hand. Yeah, and here it comes. Queen, queen, eight. 
I got pocket nines. He ends up tank calling with ace queen of diamonds. Um, and we're in a flip for what ends up being, uh, would be, uh, if I won this hand, I'd be right in second place in chips at the time. So at for sure the best seat at the table too, I got, um, I, this is who's to my direct, right. I got Ms. Rocky. Then I've got Duhamel. And then right beside him, I think is, is, uh, Dolan and Joe Chung. Like, um, you know, no, uh, you know, no, dis un discredited, <laughs> whatever you want to say it. Um, I really felt like those were the strongest players with the biggest stacks at the, at the table. And, um, uh, I had perfect position on all of them. Um, yeah, so it was, it was such a good spot. Um, obviously you can see the board here. It comes down queen, queen eight. Um, and I'm like, oh man, I'm. Let me, let me ask you first though. What, when, when, looking though back now, what you know about poker? What were the other stacks? You're saying this was for a second stack, so it was kind of probably bunched up. I guess what the the chip leaders were. Who was a duomo? Uh, he's opening jack ten off at this point. He ends up winning it. So like probably him, Chong, and 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 I think uh, well, you see, Racer was always kind of short, right? And he even had to was really lucky. But like, so where yeah. were you at the moment? What stack were you? So I am like very early on, like within two hands, I lost a ton of chips to Joe Chung, which was funny because him and I ended up doing like a swap at the final table. Um, we did like a, I think a 5% swap or something like this at the final table. And, um, and he had more chips than me. The way that it was, I went into the, the final table fifth in, in chips. It was um, Duhamel, then Dolan, then Joe Chung, then I think, I can't remember if it was Grinder or Reisner was in fourth. Um, I think it was maybe Reisner was in fourth and then me, then Grinder, and then, you know, uh, Filippo and, and Sentai and, uh, Soy win, um, beyond that. But, uh, but yeah, at this point the blinds have gone up. So I think, you know, because of the, us staying so long on that bubble from 10 down to nine, we went from like 11 PM down all the way to 7 AM the next morning, our stacks relatively were very short at this final table. Like I think, you know, Duhamel still probably had over a hundred. Um, but, but the rest of us were kind of in that like 30, 20 range and then the blinds just went up. So I think we were down around like, uh, anyway, I, I, I fell down to eighth, um, to ninth, or sorry, ninth right away. Like the second hand of, of the, the final table and then climb my way back up. I think starting the hand, I was like seventh or maybe seventh out of the eight players. Right. Yeah. Um, in, in understanding the risk premium and everything now and like the dynamics and whatever, would you still have shoved this spot and, and with your read in the situation or would you have just flatted or folded uh, here? I literally, uh, I would have, this for me was like right on the bubble, like ace queen suited. And like, like if it was pocket eights, I'm like for sure muck. Like there's no question that I, that I muck pocket nines given the table dynamic. It's very close. I think I probably could have folded here like tens, 10 still now are like, that's how close it is. We're like 10s is going in. Um, I, I I don't mind a flat as well too. I don't think flat is like a terrible spot, but there was a lot of like shoving pre and it's like, I didn't want to be in a spot as well too. I didn't really love a spot of, of me calling and then having to like think about, okay, you know, what if someone shoves in for 17 bigs behind me? What am I going to do now? Right. Um, but at the same time, it like, you know, there was fold equity and I, I really had a good feeling that, that, um, Duhamel was opening lightly and I felt like, uh, with grinder, he's probably going to three bet in the spot without, with a, with a good hand. So it's like, I really felt like, you know, this was a decent spot, especially to pick up so many chips, which I've been doing by reshoving on players. Um, so eventually, you know, he grinder also knew this, that I've been reshoving on players. So he looks me up with ace queen suited and, and there goes the hand. We, we, uh, we play it out. Let's run that run it through here on the the table so we do run it out pretty pretty crazy what were you thinking in your head did, could you believe did you think he should call with the ace queen suited so for me like I, i've thought about this a lot since and um given my table dynamic i think that maybe he should have but i know given my range he probably shouldn't have like nines was the absolute bottom of my range and ace queen suited was probably the bottom of my range as well too so um you know you you play out that range and he's really not doing well against it um so like i'm, I'm definitely not his chips well that was a lot of his chips probably right yeah so i would say he's in maybe like fifth place at this at this point so um and this was to basically go in second maybe third at the time this the equity of this pot is uh three is i think 2.7 million dollars uh, um between winning this and losing this hand so uh he ended up winning the hand goes up goes up into second place but if he had lost it he would have been the short stack by far with like you know five bigs or something like that 
Right. So, all right, let's play it out. What are you thinking when he calls and you see, and then, I mean, what are you thinking pre-flop and on the flop? <laughs> I'm like, all right, let's, let's do this. Run it out. You know, like I got pocket nines. Let's, you know, I start as 56% and uh, just win another flip, please. You know, like this is my first time of being all in since day one uh, of the main event. And it's, and it's, um, you know, in the spot of, of like, all right, got the cards got to come for you. And then when you see that flop, you're like, oh God. So I start, I remember eating like an apple or something like this or a muffin. And I'm like, okay, we want, you know, a jack or a 10 would give me a, would give me an, a straight draw as well too. So I'm just trying to think of like the different combos that, you know, could, could give me some more outs is what I'm thinking. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is it. But like, you know, I'm, I'm still a little bit hopeful and uh, you know, then the turn comes. And you spike it. What is, I, I mean, spike that is, it. like, yeah, that's, like, in your head, it's happening so fast when the flop comes you don't feel like you still have 10 percent. it feels over then when the turn comes you you might think you actually just won the hand because it's that crazy of a situation right you probably thought it. you won like you're not even though you know poker like yeah. in, in the immediate reaction is like all right i just won first of all yeah. there's only one card left i have a full house i'm all in what, what the hell how could i lose right and that's then, it then, like, did, you, like, like, did you feel that and then you instantly I'm snap like, back into reality like you could lose or yeah, like the what I actually say in in the in the real moment is I say a small card, um, you know, no, uh, small card. Give me a deuce, small card. You know, like such a final table sweat. I think is what I actually say here. And then, um, and and then, like I'm basically fading an ace, queen, or eight. You can see the percentages there. I'm I'm eighty seven percent, and uh, you know, there was a queen that was folded by Sentai as well too. Um, you know, which we find find out later on, and I think I think the eight was folded as well too, but. Uh, um or an eight was full as well too so you're just like you know you're you're thinking all right i'm in a good spot i'm not, like i'm you're, you know you're not counting it out yet you're just like all right stay in the moment you know what i mean just like yeah, that's probably where you might be buddies with him or he's i think he's canadian also or whatever someone whispered that's like where you, you hear that too someone's like i folded this and you're like you know come on or like don't say that or just like just no one do anything just be true <laughs> and then what so then then you're like you're puckered up and yeah. uh the river hits i mean what are you like is that even like real life you got to be thinking that's like uh, make believe like make believe hand. like think of this moment happening in any tournament and then think of it happening in the biggest stage in all of poker for the difference between winning and losing is three million bucks like it's right. uh, and the future, yeah exactly not to mention um and uh you know it, you know just 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 like I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a bit much to take, right? But you're, it's also like kind of like, well, shit, I ran well to get here, yeah. this and that. I got a million dollars, but it can't feel good, right? It's sort of like, yeah, it's sort of like, it's just, it's just crazy. So, I mean, what a run, what a light, you know, just an absolute experience, huge score. And then, I mean, I just like kind of, you know, not to go, dwell too much on the po I, we talk about cash, I would go through it, but then, you know, you're, you got to be feeling pretty good. You got the money from full tilt other stuff you know it's a huge boost like what was your were you like i'm gonna take over the world i'm gonna be the best poker player uh ever and like is that what you're thinking in your mind like i'm going hard and more or is it like wow i got a million business mind comes in huge score let me like go a different route how are you feeling at this moment about everything it took a couple months for me to really kind of like settle down like i remember um that bc poker championship that that basically happened right after the main event where like i kind of started out showed up and i was like you know, the star that was kind of rocking around there because it's my hometown and like everyone known I just, you know, final table, the main event and like, um, and I had the chip lead in this massive spot at, at that tournament, but I, I felt really good. Um, I ended up losing with, uh, with a flush to a guy rivering a, a boat. We we're all in on the turn. Um, and, uh, but you know, I felt really good. I, I definitely showed more emotion losing that hand where first place is only like 300 K versus, um, the, you know, the main event where I'm just like, you know, smiling and putting it together. But this, I like, I remember knocking a, a chair over and being like, what is going on here? Do you know what I mean? Like I was killing it. And like to lose against the only one that was close to me in the entire tournament. Like I was, I was first, you know, put numbers out there. I was probably like 2 million is my stack. This guy that I lost to was 1.8 and third place might've been like 800,000. Like I was just like killing it. And the one guy that I didn't want to mess with, uh, I had a flush. I had no choice. And, and, uh, um, so, you know, I felt really good. I felt really good, but I was also like, you know, there's a lot, 
there's a lot that's just happened. Like this, this, this is this is gonna sting for a little while. Um, it's, it's almost the same hand, money maker and and uh, Ivy, right? The queens really? and ace nine run out. It's like the what, most one of the more well known hands ever in a historic hand in the history of poker. The main event also was like ten left or eleven left, like super deep, super crazy, super crazy run out. Like almost was it the same flop? Queen. It's queen, literally nine, it's literally identical. I don't know if it's um like I think there maybe it it is queen queen. I can't remember if it's a different, it, I think it's even the ace of spades on the river. Like if, uh, if someone finds that link, definitely put it up. Let's see that one. Because, um, I think it's like, it might be queen, queen seven. Or uh, is it possibly flop the full house? No, I think it did flip flop, flip flop. It did, yeah. it did the exact same way. Yeah, Ivy versus head. moneymaker in, in, uh, in the 2003 hand. Yeah. So, and then they got it all in on the turn moneymakers like fist pumping. He had the ace queen and rivers, the ace versus Ivy. That had pocket nines. It was either like check check on the flop. No, it was a small bet, and he calls, and then they just like explode chips in there on the turn. Of course, right? Like they got these massive hands, um, but literally identical, almost the exact same run out. You know, Ivy had the nines, and uh, uh, yeah. and, yeah. and and again, not well. Let's fast forward, but you do win a bracelet then next year, yes, uh, for eight hundred k. And and just a little fun note, I think you mentioned that you actually knock out uh, the. The man that knocked you out, you you end up winning this on day one, but you knock out um, uh, Mizraki with nines to Queens, actually. So you actually got there. And look at Duat Mola's deep. Go figure yeah. again in this tournament again. But uh, is that true? You knock out with nines, you sucked out a little bit, and then you end up going on to win the tournament? I did, yeah. The very last hand of day one, I remember playing all day one with Vanessa Selps, and I finally um, knocked her out. She ended up going on to be my coach in a couple of years later. Like uh, She was just a, a beast, especially back then. And... Um, uh, but yeah, I went to the fine, went to a six max, the six it is a six max tournament, um, 5k, like just the, the player, one of the players tournaments. And, um, he, uh, uh, we ended up having a three way all in the last hand of day one. I'm the chip leader of the tournament at the time. And if I lose this hand, like it, you know, relative, let's say I had 500k, it was against like a 70k stack and a 40k stack. Like, you know, I still would have been up there, but, um, but Ms. Rocky was the 40k stack. He had pocket queens, I had pocket nines, another guy had ace king, and I I spike a nine, I think on the river actually as well too. But uh um, and, and yeah. how how is this like in terms of uh so now you hit an 800 k score in a little different scenario, a little different buy-in, you're in a different place financially, maybe you have a bigger piece or all of it, or you know, yeah, the majority basically. of it. How yeah. was this? Was this actually your biggest score then? This you? was, yeah. Uh, wasn't my biggest score because eighth place was still over a million. But no, basically, no, but I'm saying for you, like net financially, personally, uh, still financially, personally, the last one was bigger. Um, was the main event was was bigger, but um, this one was amazing as well too. Like it was like, you know, I do remember it. You know, when you win a poker tournament, Jeff, and you like are on a roll, like it, like because I also won uh the Ubok High Roller in January for like 150k online or something like this too. So I was, yeah, I, I was doing well. But when you're in a spot where it's like you see the players in the tournament and they're constantly going back and forth and looking at the payouts and the jumps and things like this, you're just like, man, I'm going to attack these guys. Um, I'm going to put them to tests. And uh, that is really the big advantage of like coming on this on why, why you see a lot of people going on runs where they, you know, win a few or go deep in a bunch in a row. Um, and that's kind of the feeling that I was going into that. That next year, I still had a chip on my shoulder. I still wanted to like prove that I, you know, des deserving of being at that main event final table, wanted to back it up with something, um, you know, hadn't had really any results up until that one tournament. And then just, uh, but I love six max. Like I played so much six max in my life. And uh, um, yeah, like, uh, you know, Daniel Negron, who also went deep in that tournament, Duhamel, we're talking about as well too. And then uh, um, made that final table, was all in on bluffs twice, where if, if the person had just called, uh, my I was done at that final table. So you know, I was putting the pressure on, um, and, uh, yeah, eventually got heads up versus, um, Justin there. Um, that heads up battle went forever. Like we, we played for seven hours until I finally want to flip against him, um, in the, like the last hand. And because they saw how deep we went the year before with the main event finishing at 7 AM, they put the 3 AM cut, um, in the, in the next year. So this, that flip was one at like 255 or something like this AM. So I came back as like a, you know, I don't know, probably a, a 25 to one chip lead uh, against him and, and finish it off in about four hands the next day. Um, but uh, the cool thing was, is that Negrano had a big piece of um, 
of Justin in that in that. So he watched the entire heads up match. Like he he basically sat in the corner and and uh, you know obviously a big fan of of Daniel. Like he's uh, he's been a beast over the years, especially being Canadian as well. And and um, uh, so he was on on one side watching the whole thing take place. Um, I had a really loud and rowdy crowd, so they were just like going off, including Duhamel was in my in my corner as well too. He, we had a, a prop bet where he had to wear a Jarvis Canucks jersey. Um, so he had, he had, he had made that up cause he, he lost the last longer versus me. So he's in my corner going, going loud, lots of beers flowing and stuff like this. So awesome. yeah, it it's, a, it's a great, it's a great environment. Yeah. That flop was queen six, queen turn nine river ace. So I don't know if it was a spade or not, but there you go. So yeah. pretty, pretty, pretty spooky, um, <laughs> crazy run out. So ace queen, man, that hand, uh, generally that's my big problem, man. I can in poker. What's your, what's your favorite poker hand and your least favorite? Like that are, that are normal hands, right? To play. Yeah, well, pocket nine's probably got my least favorite just because uh, of the, you know, the the. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, my my least favorite is probably um, ace jack off. I would say. Um, kind of, yeah, one of those those ones that don't ever. Yeah, it's hard to get like great value, and you're sort of in weird spots and tough decisions. Yeah, that. there's oftentimes you're on like jack nine boards or jack ten boards where it's like you're up versus like king queen or or you know um in spots where they got overs and a gut shot and things like this and yeah for me ace jack is pretty vulnerable and i yeah don't love it there that makes that makes perfect sense i'm more alliance i think mine's ace queen but it's a you know ace queen is a as we know it can it can win we've seen big hands win uh i have there's a lot of questions we have a giveaway i do want to cool. definitely touch on some other stuff here but just so you guys know i want to announce again you can give matt a follow cash live as well on twitter on instagram uh that is um oh I know, actually, I'm gonna pull uh, Cash Live. I, I, I actually, I actually do get the notifications help because, like, like I said, I love the game, but it's like nice when I get a 10 minute notice or I'm at a dinner, I'm in the car, someone around. I was like, yeah, it's just one of those things. It doesn't take long. It's fun. It's quick. It's like you know, it's not the prizes are the, the 180 people make money, right? Nine, yeah. uh, the final table is more juicy, and, and 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 again, you maybe touch a bit on that. What is the plan currently? Like, what do people expect? The, the prizes, could you maybe discuss a little bit what they are, what they might be, oh. other ideas? Is that something – now, it seems like there's a lot of room with sponsors because, like, the cash prize is cool, but you start act as the game grows, more users, like, more opportunities, trips, free roll. Like, you probably, yeah. you know, really button up some nice stuff down the road, especially with the success and people enjoy it. Is, that, is that sort of the plan? So, totally. And we're sprinkling more of that in as, as much as we can here. We're, uh, you know, right now, we are, each prize pool, every, every game is $125 minimum. So we pay out – uh, the final table, first place is 30 bucks, uh, all you and USD, 30, 20, 15, 10, 5. Um, and then we pay out 25 cents to all of our min cashers. So we're not talking about crazy money, but I really feel like a lot of people play it just because they're like, they love the format. They love the hosts that like, they love the, you know, kind of this interactive, uh, easy, you know, and, and making the final table, like it really is like giving them almost like their 15 seconds of fame. Do you know what I mean? Like it really makes them feel like, they've they have having that final table experience that i did do you know what i mean and i'm just trying to give a little piece of that um to people out there because i just know how it felt for me and and uh um and the all under fold format like you know we talk about this nine versus ace queen hand it like those situations happen all the time in this format because you have so many people going all in and whoever's leading on the turn definitely doesn't mean they're going to be winning on the river because you have multiple people going all in all the time. So it's, uh, it really creates these fun, exciting moments. And, um, uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's really kind of all coming back to that one hand and trying to recreate that, that, um, that experience So just so many people approach me on that nines versus ace queen hand. I just really felt there was something emotionally and something, something there. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really, um, I, you know, I've spent the, spent the next, many years trying to recreate it and and uh yeah it's 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 been cool to actually do so it really feels like our community is feeling like they they love it and 1100 players playing it every single game and and um you know i don't take that lightly at all like we're you know the that it's not going to stay there but for those 1100 players like you know i got nothing but love for them and, and we're going to keep doing whatever we can to make sure that uh you know their 15 20 minutes worth of time every time is uh um is something we we uh we don't take lightly I love that as like an investor, as like aligned with you and all this, I can actually kind of, we get to catch up. We just caught up the other day and I know you're busy and on your stuff, but as a kind of questions come to my mind too, I'm always thinking how can I improve or as an experience, like able, cause you or yourself know poker, how can it make more fun? How can people, what, what are, what things are going on? But I guess, I guess I'm thinking, and we've talked about this though. 
for the 1100 people only you know 180 cash that's cool not it's like a min cash like you said that's not you want to make the final table more going all in are there would it would it make sense to like break it up into uh different groups or flights or maybe like you said maybe more in a day but i'm just trying to think too because like let's say it hits 10k users 100k yeah. users like that all of a sudden doesn't make a ton of sense. Like if you have a hundred thousand users and six or five, nine make the final table, you know, it's almost like can't work. Right. Cause it's even not enough hands or right. like six rounds or to separate or find it, how mm -hmm. you do. So like what, when you do hit the goal or as it grows, and I guess there's different games, roulette, blackjack, other opportunities too, and which in itself provides presents, I guess, problems or, or, or not problems, but different situations. Right. Cause then you got yeah. different hosts or different times. And like, what are the things, but, if it hits 10,000 users, how does that work then for the final table? Is it still six oh. make a final table? Is there two games? Is there different flights? Do you, totally. you know, do you, how do you do it? Totally. So right now, five players make the final table and, you know, we're looking um, down the road to add a sixth player in at that final table. Now, what that'll do is that won't just be for one player. That will be for what's called a community player. So the fun thing about this is like, we're going to look for ways for people, keep people engaged right from start, right to the finish, um, where that community player will get to be part of all the community that's still in in playing, and they'll get to basically basically vote whether they want to swipe right to go all in or swipe left to, to fold, and whatever the community says or, or whatever the democracy says, that's what that player will will do. So, you know. Wait, so you're, but like in that community, is someone from the community acting on that or no, it's just going to be like whoever's watching still in, they get to vote and that vote then is, and they're just part of it. If you're still they're part the of it. And if, and if that player wins or maybe even comes second, there will be some kind of cash reward for, for those players. So, um, so yeah, so there's always, you know, we're, we're looking for ways to keep people engaged for as long as possible, keep them, you know, finding ways for them to love the experience. This is a way that um, doesn't matter how many players we get to, they'll always be able to participate in the final table and, uh, you know, uh, potentially win something if, uh, if, uh, their player wins. Okay. And I am going to go pretty soon. We're going to dive in again, and guys, $55 ticket courtesy of party poker. We're going to go ahead and do questions. You guys have a chance to ask a question and be entered into the, the drawing for that, uh, whether you, your question gets read or not. Uh, but I, I have a few more for Matt myself before we do that. And I guess, um, I want to understand a little more about your your poker online career and what you did. How many tables did you play at a time? Did you use HUDs? Like, what was the most tables you ever played? What do you think was the optimal? I'm always curious on that. Yeah, I, I played, uh, I see maybe like 13, 14 was my max, but I definitely wasn't optimal with that at all. Like, I was, uh, I did use, use HUD, um, you know, I, I tried with it and without it in, in, um, in different scenarios. Um, I, my optimal, honestly, was probably like six. I would say six. And then as the day got later, it even went down to four. Like I really felt like that's kind of my, was like my, my, my sweet spot. I could really kind of like focus right. on, you know, um, one screen basically of like several, several, uh, you know, um, tables going on there, but that was kind of my optimal spot. Very cool. Um, all right, let's talk about the pandemic COVID, uh, sort of now there's vaccines, things are sort of opening up a bit for poker and life in general. But tell me about the uh, sort of uh, pandemic for you. Was there positive things that came out of lockdown in personal life? Like with, especially business related, you know, kind of like there's weddings, there's travel, there's this, there's all these things. And now you're just sort of there. Like, was this yeah. a positive from the perspective of cash live from business to be focused, to be in one place and others to be in one place? How, how did this in, interact with your life in general? I think in, um, so on the poker side of things, like I think, I think in many ways, uh, COVID or the pandemic really re-sparked online poker. Like, I think it really kind of put put that bit back into a lot of people. Um, you know, they couldn't get together to play basketball or to do, um, you know, t uh, all these different games that they, they used to get together and, and do. Um, so they play poker together, like little small groups getting together and, and playing online poker, sit and goes and things like this. So um, that really, I think, helped the business to kind of really re-spark the online poker world. Not to necessarily say that, Online poker players are our only target market. Like we are very wide in the the players that that join the game, right? anywhere from like the top pros to um, to absolute beginners that have never played poker before. Um, for me personally, it really kind of allowed me to just like heads down focus on cash live and like taking it to the to the next level. Um, 
you know, not without challenges though. Like you're, you know, you're doing that working from home a lot of the times, like, you know, um, your daughter back, my, my daughter back and forth could go to school, couldn't go to school depending on what was happening at school. So it's like, you know, trying to work well and taking calls like investor calls or, or strategic partner calls or whatever. And we're like, like I got my daughter back here trying to draw on all over the place and stuff like this, you know, um, as I'm sure your, your son's name is, is Joseph. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. As I'm sure you've seen and, and experienced at, di at di different points as well too. And, and, uh, you know, you, um, you know, you just find a way through, man, where I think that's what we're all doing right now. And, and it hasn't been easy, but, um, we're definitely looking forward to life getting a little back closer to normal. That's for sure. It's awesome. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's, it's, uh, it depends different industries, different things. Everyone's been affected in different ways. And I do think though, within poker in this community and just if business, if you're able to work from home or in an area and go be around, I think it is, there are some positives in terms of getting stuff done and being focused and whatnot, but of course, terrible thing and been a, been a pretty crazy uh, year roughly or so. And I guess even over now, um, and hopefully everything starts clearing up. How, how's your area been where you live though? Like in terms of black, I'm always curious on different regions, countries, cities, how, how is it there? What is it? Restaurants closed? Is it people wearing a mask all the time? You know, I, I've been spent a decent bit of time in Miami where it's sort of like, the world just as is and people are out and restaurants have been open and it's like whatever. Um, so it's a little less intense, but other places I've been or people I know say it's very intense. So where does it fall on the scale where you live in terms of lockdown and COVID and restrictions? Yeah. So we're, we're kind of like one of the most restricted places right, right now, or, you know, other parts of Canada are even more restricted. I'm based out of Vancouver um, where, you know, wife and I last night went to a restaurant, but when we go in, we're wearing a mask. Um, everyone's distance from each other, like, you know, uh, tables are kind of closed down. You can't be anywhere six feet from one another. Um, we can't travel at all. Or when we do, we got to quarantine for, 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 for 14 days, um, still. So, which is such a, such a pain. Um, my mother-in-law just basically came up as well too, from, from the U S she had to quarantine for, for two weeks. Um, so there's still, it's still pretty bad up here and we're, we're hoping to, uh, uh, to kind of have it go the other direction. But I do think that for moments, you know, Vancouver was better than a lot of places as well, too. And, you know, maybe that's why we're in the situation we're in we're in right now and, and that it's, uh, you know, kind of taking taking a couple steps backwards. Right. No, for sure. I see some people in the chat talking about Montreal. I know that's had a tough, tough go oh. there. I think they're uh, Orb saying they are finally opened up and eating in side at least uh or maybe it was outside it was open now inside as well but yeah it's uh you know different it's kind of crazy right the world is in and a lot of first world and countries that the information even one county or city or state like things are just different right it's kind of confusing when world leaders and the president or the governor or the mayor are saying different things and doing different oh, no. stuff you kind of like you know you gotta make put you in some tough tough uh tough spots so um True. yeah i hope everyone you know again we always say this hope everyone's doing well, getting through it. And hopefully we all kind of move forward and then uh, find ways to be better and, and use it to an advantage if we can and be stronger. Um, well, yeah. let's, let's take some questions. Cause we got a lot. Love to see. Let's do it. Fire away. Right right. I love it. We got, we got a lot. Let me just refresh this one more time. We'll go here again, a $55 ticket going to give away courtesy of party poker. So you guys can go ahead and uh, ask the cash live poker founder and CEO Matt Jarvis. He's here. He's ready to answer. And we're going to rock and roll some of these until, the end so let's uh, we'll try to do as many of these as we can how are you on time all good for now i'm good man yeah fire away let's answer these questions all right we got you got two and a half hours two hours 20 minutes till the the next show right so at least till then you're <laughs> that's, so, right. that's right i gotta jump on there you know yes we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll do as many as we can um yeah. we just talked about starting hands what gives you trouble what you like we'll uh move on to that weather in the city how's the weather how is it in general it's it's decent. We're still getting a little bit of rain here and there. Um, this is Vancouver. We get a lot of rain. It's it's beautiful. We've got lots of green greenery. But um, you know, don't count any month out for not getting rain here. That's for darn sure. All right. So weather, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely. I've been there. I agree with that statement. Craig Leonard wants to know what is the best place to go in Vegas on a budget to stay. Uh, so before November nine bracelet winner, where was Jarvis when he was just kind of flying in and you know trying to get get through to the next. Two five uh, limit game two four. You know when where were you doing at the beginning? Where where'd you like to go for value? I was looking at like Mirage because I used to play cash there a lot. I, I try and find like deals um, to stay at the Mirage. Um, you know, even for me, like we haven't talked about this yet, Jeff. But I, every dinner break when I would go down to the World Series, I don't sit around with other poker players and eat food. I actually go run over to the Gold Coast. And I bowl like two games of uh, like bowling uh, for like two games 
uh, so I can like stay fresh and like not be sitting around eating a heavy meal, just talk constantly talking poker. So I, I'd say Gold Coast is probably a, a decent option as well too. They got some good food options over there. You're really close to the the, the World Series and the Rio action. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's a, a pretty decent option. And uh, yeah, so much like like 24 hours bowling. Like uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I love me uh, to throw a few. Threw balls down at some pins, my man. That's what I'm loving. That's a good way to get off tilt. You know, if there's a lot of bad beat tournaments, there's a lot of confrontation, a lot of collisions. There's a lot of all in. So, you know, I, uh, I, I can't agree more. It's nice. That's a nice and, and good location. Great recommendation. Kevin Hayes asked, does Matt think the break between WSOP and the November nine was an advantage or disadvantage? Let's talk about for you personally. And then let's take medium player. Say all things equal advantage yeah. or disadvantage. And what about for you? For me, I think it was a disadvantage um, because obviously I was, I would have been riding the high or that wave of that, like, you know, having my chips increase from, from Brandon Stevens stack. Um, I also feel like the other players were, were probably able to get a little bit better. Um, so I think for me personally, probably a disadvantage um, for uh, just because I, I felt pretty strong about my game. And, and um, we had a really good final table though. Like we listed off the players that played at like Duhamel, Mizraki, Joe Chung, like Dolan, like, you know, yeah, Jason Sentai, Raysoner, like it, you know, Filippo, like it was, it was a pretty strong final table. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think in general, I liked, I like my chances if I did it, you know, if we came back the next day instead. Yeah. But for, for everyone on average though, I would say uh, for an average player, um having the four month break off is an advantage because then you can bring on coaches you can like get your mental game sharp you can like really take a break and separate you know getting to the final table from actually playing the final table and really put your work put your work in and, and you know maximize that time right and um this question right here from giovanni i really like the question and i'm going to take it a step further yes what does it feel like to win the wsop and i see by i guess you could add win the wsop brace like because you didn't win the main you won you got eight in the main but you want to brace it but you actually may be the perfect person for this question that i think is like a very good poker question i hear this a lot over the years you know look at these two so we got you can even line it up within the period of time so you got you got a million dollar score eighth place november nine and then you got basically the same, very close, relatively uh, 808K and winning a prestigious one, six-handed 5K, one of the more prestigious events, the six six maxes events, a little more skill, can't hide. You're always sort of in the action, you know, whatever. So take, if you had to only choose one, you get to both. Let's even bump that up for a million for first, all things equal, the, the cash or, or take it down the other way. However you want to look at it. Say it's 900K each, right? What yeah. do you take? The November nine uh experience in the in, in the final table of the main event or do you take first place in the 5k six max for the same exact amount of money what do you choose get to do one i, I take november nine hands down every single oh. time and and the reason why like winning a brace that's amazing but like there's so many bracelet winners every single year like it's very difficult to remember them all do you know what i mean like for sure the 5k six max is kind of up there in in, in, in tournaments but very rarely do I get referred to as like a bracelet winner more. So it's like, you know, former November nine or cause people remember me from that moment. It's like, you know, there's not all eyes were on my final table, you know, in the poker world. Do you know what I mean? At, at that, yeah. at that time. Right. Like it's like, it's really, um, there's different sponsorship opportunities. There's a lot of cool things that came from it afterwards. And I just, uh, you know, you don't necessarily get that from winning a bracelet. Super interesting. I would be, sh I, I think like, again, you are the perfect person. Like you might, no one else, maybe there's a few, I guess that have won a bracelet and done the same, but like you, in this period of short, within a year period of time, having that and getting to answer that, I, I'll take your, uh, for what it's worth. I would love to do a poll question on this. Uh, Marco ghost of M in the chat. Can you please clip this? We are going to, you got to use this. I got to know, because I would guess that the public, the community, the people myself may be included at first guess would think that just winning a bracelet is more like to get first, to have that moment, especially in the six, not as like it's a six max uh, prestigious one, but I don't know. You're right. I guess, you know, if you, and also if you think the November nine, how many years were the November nine, I believe 2009, the first year, I don't know when they stopped. Was it? 16, I think, I think it was 2007. Uh, so I think they started oh. like earlier, like it was a few years earlier. Like I remember Ivy made the November nine one year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it ended at like 2000 and 
12. So I think they may have done it like two wow. years after, maybe three years after. It, no, because cannolis was 15. They did November. 9th. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So that, that might've been the last year. So maybe they did it for like an eight year stretch, something like that. Yeah. There, uh, 16 or 17 sounds right. Maybe. Even yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably that. Cause actually I think for a year or two, it was yeah. definitely gone and then COVID and who knows. Oh, also do you play the world series every year? Is that like, are you like, I'm playing the main, is that just something you do or have you not played in the last few years? I think I played in 16, but like after having that deep run in 2015, I put my heart and soul into that. Um, and I actually put my heart and soul again into 2016, I think. And, um, but beyond that, I, I just haven't, I haven't been pulled back in the same way. And part of that is like, you know, trying to run different businesses, you know, having daughters, um, realizing what it's going to take. Uh, there's still a chance I go down there this year. Like we'll, we'll see how it goes, but, uh, maybe do some ca cash live promotions down there and, and, uh, um, but yeah, who knows? We, we still kind of got to discuss that and, and talk about that as a team, but I, I miss it, man. It's, uh, I, as I'm sure a lot of people that have missed, you know, the actual world series of poker experience, um, for a while. And it's, uh, there's nothing quite like it. I've, I've traveled the world playing poker. And, and as you know, it's like, you know, when you're, when you're in the Rio during that time, it's, uh, it's just buzzing, man. It's just, it's just buzzing. Yeah, no, it's just different. And what about this year, though? What do you think about the October, November? Is that exciting to you Dip because it's different? It's different weather, maybe even just scheduling. Is it easier for you? Like, do you plan to play that in November, the the uh, final table then? Or, or, well, the final, table, yeah. or, uh, the final table for sure. I'm, I'm there. Yeah. Can I just buy right into the final table? Is that, is that how it works? Fun. That would be quite a – yeah, I think a lot of people do that. So, yeah, that's uh, – what, what is your plan? Do you have WSOP plans this year? I, like it'd probably be a family and company decision for me. Um, so it just, it'll depend on where cash live is at and it'll probably depend on, uh, you know, uh, how the, how the wife feels about it. For sure. Yeah. It's different now. I mean, I, I tell people this, my friends or they're younger that are not, don't have a relationship, don't have a marriage, don't have a kid, different things, all are different, but enjoy the time as a poker, if you play poker, grinding, traveling, the, you know, all that stuff, like get it, do it. Because when you have kids, when you have a marriage, you know, it's just different. Like, it's just not so easy. You don't like, when's the last time you just rolled into the local casino and played two five? Probably don't. Like, I don't do that. Like I, you know, I once in a while play a big game or something cool, or I'll go to a tournament here and there, but it's just not the same. And it's just, it's like, you know, Bill Perkins book, Die With Zero. He really talks about different stages of life and getting the most out of those different different periods and and that's sort of the truth like it's just different right like it isn't better or worse it's just different time different different thing and you know cherish those moments from a poker's perspective because if you're ever grinding like oh this is whatever, like no like you aren't always going to get to do it it goes in waves i hope i get back like i would love when i'm you know down the line kids grow up a little bit things yeah. whatever you know hopefully cash live we you know cash out for a for a four bill just like uh play tika and, and and selling that you know whatever like that would be great, but you never know. And you just don't know what poker is going to be or how it is. So enjoy it, maximize it. And then, you know, it's like how we are now. It's like, oh, I hope I play the main this year. You never would think it was like that, but. Yeah. Um, can you imagine that pre kids like saying, saying that to yourself and like yeah. pretty like, you know what I mean? It's like, you're like, like that almost sounds crazy to you, but like that, that is, is like these days. So I, I totally agree. And everyone that's listening, you know, maximize, uh, listen to Bill Perkins on that one for sure. Maximize, uh, those stages of life the best that you can. And, and uh, there's some amazing moments as parents and amazing moments as, uh, you know, where, where I'm at these days. Um, so just wherever you're at, trying to try and maximize it and get the most out of it. I completely agree. Uh, we got a question from the man, the myth, ghost of them in the chat today asks, please ask Matt, it feels like Canada and the U.S. are fundamentally different in promoting entrepreneurship in which he thinks provides a better environment to build a new company. What a question, Marco, what do you think? Tell me, Matt. That is, that's a good question. Um, very good question. I like, they definitely do in Canada. What I will say is that, you know, there's not the, the funding resources in Canada, um, the same way. So I would love, um, if Canadian entrepreneurs felt as supported as, as probably, um, some, some American entrepreneurs, um, and there's great government funding options. Like we, we've really tapped into some amazing government funding options, but as far as like, you know, if we go to, to fundraise and stuff like this, very rarely are we talking to Canadian investors or, you know, venture groups here in, in, in Canada. We're almost always going, you know, New York, Silicon Valley, LA, like, you know, talking to different groups in re regards to that. So, um, you know, I hope that, you, you know, there's more of, of those kind of groups that are, are formed here in, in Canada from an entrepreneurial. I don't, I wouldn't necessarily agree just on like as an entrepreneur's 
in general, because I've, I've been the different, you know, an entrepreneur in different things, whether it's my, my shack shine business or owning trailer parks, like I've seen it on both sides of the border. And um, yeah, long story short, it's, uh, um, you know, I really feel like it's not that big of a difference uh, from Canada to the US. And yeah, uh, that's very, it's a very interesting question. That's good. It's oh, interesting to hear perspective yeah. doing some of both. Um, I, and also just that feeling, we got to answer the question still because I, I, I took it off in another second. I'm super interested about what the difference in feeling is, but how did it feel to actually win that bracelet though? Like it's got to, it's almost interesting, right? It's kind of like if you could choose one or the other, but the actual like instant feeling has got to be different to take first oh. to win the bracelet versus like, all right, hit the November nine. It's excitement. It's like, wow. Like you get those months of, you know, like just uh, euphoria and what if. But that actual moment of taking it down, being the last one standing, getting the trophy, getting that, like, it's got to be pretty unique in itself. It, it is, 100%. It's, uh, you know, like, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have wanted it in any different order for myself. Um, you know, it, it, the way that the things did, winning the bracelet the year after, you know, really having that chip on my shoulder of, like, really trying to, like, you know, prove to the poker world and prove to myself that I deserve to be at that main event final table. Because in many ways, kind of like you said, you know, at least for live earnings, I kind of came out of nowhere um, to make that final table that year. Um, but to win a brace of the next year was like, you know, made me feel like, look, I'm, I was deserving. Do you know what I mean? I was um, meant to be at that final table and that, and that I, I earned um, being there. So winning that brace of though, having your friends in, in the, in um in the crowd and like literally i was just yelling like like just bear hugging everyone i'm in um i meant uh like i remember pascal and like my buddy ash and uh yeah pascal lafrancois my, my buddy ash like my wife was there like so many of my friends um were there and, and there to support me and uh just the yell that came from that and then afterwards the very next day of basically like standing on the podium and like hearing your national anthem in front of like tons of people that are watching and um yeah there's that's a such a cool experience as well as well too that, that's i saw pascal yeah also what he finished 10th or 11th or 11th maybe and exactly. that, what a great player he has a very famous uh world series photo where he has a shirt off winning his bracelet and he actually got uh was it yeah he wait i'm thinking was it him or yes it was him i played at the wpt montreal we played at one of my more memorable hands i played where I had fours and they had King 10 off. We were three handed for the WPT and it, we got it all in. And it was at his home crowd, him and Jonathan Wah, who are both locals there. I was in playground, 1200 person WPT. And I flop a set of fours. He had King 10 off and it came Jack eight, four, two, two hearts. He had King 10 off one heart. And then he went running queen ace um, of hearts. And uh, they went insane. I've never heard people go that crazy. And I still was in, but it would have been like, knock him out, be heads up, have the, be like, even stacked, you know, instead I was super short and hung around and then got third, but that was a six sweat. And actually a Canadian, Mark Radoja, who's part of that crew yeah. too, was very I know Mark, yeah. I was heads up for a bracelet with ace jack to king 10 and um, his king 10, you know, whatever. We were like four, it was, same thing you mentioned, it stops. They stop at like 2 a.m. or whatever. We were playing till 3.30 in the morning and then they said they were going to stop it soon. And then we got it all in like 15 to 13 blinds. It was like, ace jack to king 10 and and i and you know whatever i lost and i got second and it was like he had me slightly covered and like those are you know it's crazy right because you think of like life and you think of variance i think that's one of the things i, I want to ask you how you feel poker and business how it has helped you with variance with dealing with wins and losses with dealing with highs and lows with dealing with you know percentages and this like how did how are you able to kind of take those experiences and, and use that as a beneficial uh part of your business world and real life, because I have like, I have so many things I can think of that I, I believe it has helped me with life and tools and the poker table and the, all this. Is there anything in particular, maybe focus on one or two that are yeah. just like, you are like, wow, I'm so happy I played poker. And this is how I, 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 I hone this energy. I hone these experiences and I, I use this in my life. W give me, give me one or two. Yeah. hundred percent. So variance wise, like, you know, um, man, you, let, let's say bring on investors for one thing, like, like you can go months similar, to like winning poker tournaments, you can go months without bringing on the, the right one. And then all of a sudden one comes and it just like sparks several others. And, um, and, you know, building a startup, like a lot of times, like you, you need that unless you're going to fund it yourself. Um, so just, just finding ways to, to wait it out, 
um, you know, be there, be resilient. Do you know what I mean? Like be like, you know, like you could get 80 no's in a row, just like you can get 80 bricked tournaments in a row. Um, especially if you're playing online, like the amount of volume you put in, you're just constantly going after it and just realizing that like, look, you know, my day will come, uh, you know, you just got to keep, keep working at, keep working at. So I'd say that's one. Another thing too, is like, you know, even just recently we lost a couple of employees, you know what I mean? Like, um, one had to leave for medical reasons and the other, um, got, got poached by, uh, uh something that kind of more aligned with this long-term vision. And, um, and these are two of our like top, uh, top people on the, on the dev team. Um, but you know, it's same thing. It's just like, look, this is going to happen. Sometimes you got to be resilient. You got to like, right. you know, take yeah, it's, it's not, a, it's not about what happens, how you react. I mean, I know Martin Jacobson said this quote, it wasn't his, but he, he, he used this from, and I think it's so true. It's like luck is when preparation meets opportunity, but like a lot of stuff's out of your control. You know, like you have to get lucky. You have to win flip. You don't, you have to hit that flush versus the guy's aces or on day, day one. one. Like, it's yeah. just different. Like it's like, and, and, and why, why did you get that? Like, is it, you, you know, it. like you start going about matrix and life and taught like what is and why yeah. do things happen and energy is powerful and like all these different things, but ultimately you got to put yourself in the right place. Give you, keep doing the right thing. And, you know, ultimately you, you create your own luck at some degree. So I think, yeah. that, you know, you kind of touching on all that, but that's like a big, I believe with uh, a lot of what you're saying. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's powerful. So so Jeff, one more point on that. Like, like I used to write things on my hand all the time. Um, when I, when I, when I entered a poker tournament and for some reason this year, like right before that main event, I, that's when I just started this. And one of the things I wrote on my hand was why not me? And for me, that's like one of the biggest things that's ever stuck in my head of being like, look, I practice as I, I study as much as these guys do. I put in the hours as much as these guys do. I, um, you know, I'm running on my breaks. I'm doing whatever I can to like stay mentally focused all the time. Why not me? And like it honestly, that little thing opened up the box for me to basically allow myself to feel deserving of success. And literally like there was a, like a, a switch. Do you know what I mean? It, it like right after that, I, I like November 9th and, and, you know, we talk about little, you know, we're talking about little things like matrix and all this kind of stuff and things that can, you know, how things play out for me, just like that why not me um mental switch uh, and i think it happened actually after the venetian tournament that we talked about of like getting deep and finishing 13th and first place was 250k or whatever and i'm like didn't quite get there but i'm like look i work as hard as these guys do i put in the hours i'm deserving of success why not me and every tournament i played from from there on i wrote that on my hand and and uh yeah, exactly. and i keep it keep that in business world as well too shout out to helmut who i know is invested as well and a very good friend of mine also been on the podcast and he's publicly said that. So again, I don't, I don't think it's like it's not a secret who's invested or not, but I just yeah. not going to say Helmus, obviously he's a cheerleader. He's, he's out there. He's been on, he's talked about it and he's, uh, he's definitely one of the, the people good to have on board, but he has got his book positivity sort of yeah. like that. Like the secret to sort of outward and being positive, putting it out there. You see the Paul fight versus my, uh, Mayweather, which you could argue is, was it just an ex it's an exhibition. They're just, you know, it wasn't like the greatest fight ever, but from a, from a narrative of like, wow, this guy was a YouTuber. He's in his, he's yeah. now fighting Floyd Mayweather and, and going eight rounds. Like it's pretty inspirational, even though like you could argue it's like, whatever, is it even, you know, this and that, but like that kind of stuff, right? Like believe, push the boundaries and, and uh, you know, set new highs. So um, I think that, that all, yeah, all that stuff is good. All right. Let's take a few more. I mean, there's a lot. Yeah. So guys, just to know $55 on the line. I'm going to go through, I'll read them and maybe Matt can even, you know, if we don't get all to all of them, he can kind of, reply to some yeah 100 percent some of this but uh let's just kind of go through and look at all that look at all this the 80 questions or so which is i love it beauty question. um let's take uh this one is a different language uh we've talked about some of this uh what about business goal in life i mean give me give me a business goal in your life business goal in life um Okay, so one, I want to break the world record for the biggest ever poker tournament in and and do that on Cash Live. Um, so right now that number is uh, two hundred and fifty four thousand. Um, it was a, a tournament on Poker Stars, um, and I want to have more than that number on Cash Live. So right now that's like uh, at the tip of my mind. That's the uh, one of the goals that I'm, I'm I, I see is like the. That yeah. would count if you got 255,000 users on this, they would count as a poker tournament, right? You know exactly. Yeah, totally. Wow. So, so that what would, is, what is that? What is that? 
What does that put Cash Live worth? Worth if there's two hundred fifty-five thousand users <laughs> one day? I mean, it'd be it's off the scale, right? That's uh, that's a good question. One of our one of our you know our our only VC investors basically said to us, "Look, get get to ten k, and we're uh, of ten k um, daily active users. So we're right now we're around two k of that right now, and we're we're very interested in investing um, further. And they're one of the top VCs, early investor in Snap, early investors in Shopify, and a bunch of others, but." Uh, so if 10K is a very exciting opportunity for them, you can obviously, you know, figure out that 254, um, you know, concurrent players is like just through the through the roof. So, yeah, to the moon, brother, to the moon. I love it. Um, question, quick one. Do you play chess? Yeah, I don't. I used to when I was young. I was in the chess club in like grade six and seven, but but don't really play. I haven't really played since. And uh, we've got another question here from Man Without Honor. Interesting uh, username. What do you like to do when you finish a tournament? When I finish a tournament, how have I done in that tournament? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, like if you've done well, you got to celebrate. Um, I, my big thing is like, you know, you can't just be celebrating when you win poker tournaments. It, it just like you're going to have no moments of celebration in your life if you're a tournament grinder. So realize that like 16th place is something we're celebrating realize that like you know um like a final table is worth celebrating and all these moments in between don't feel like you can only win to be excited do you know what i mean like uh making him being the first guy to make in the min cash and then being the first guy knocked out you're like sweet like like you know i, I could have been the, i could have been the bubble boy do you know what i mean just little things like that uh so enjoy the moments and um yeah that that's what i would say for uh uh for that very cool. Ryder says, how does Cash Live make money? Uh, make make live poker money. How does Cash Live yeah. poker make money? So yeah, explain a bit Great about question. the business because I think it's a little confusing too, uncertain. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of a, a deeper question, but a lot of companies are user-based. A lot of companies are acquisition-based. What is, how does, how does per se Cash Live actually make money or what is sort of the business goal or plan? Totally. That's a great question. So we make money through advertising um, and sponsorship. So that that's basically how we make money. Um, we partner with an advertiser. They'll pay us for, you know, promoting their brand within the game and um, and we promote them uh, and they'll maybe supply part of the prize pool or whatever. But then we'll make money from that from that side as well, too. So um, that's how Cash Live makes money down the road. We'll look for for different other ways to, to monetize things like in-app purchases and things like this, but they cannot be anything that will increase somebody's chances of winning like a rebuy or something like this or a top up or whatever, because um, that would then become gambling. And the future of cash live is to offer a real money version um, where people can actually buy in, if they get knocked out, they can rebuy and all this kind of stuff. But at least for this version right now, we're completely free to play. And, uh, and this version in the app store will, will always be, uh, will always be that way. Very interesting. Um, Let's see some great questions here. Someone, D Duck Dodgers, is asking, "Will I ever make it uh, to your show anytime soon for Cash Live?" In terms of hosting, how are people able to do remote hosting? I know this was talked about. Um, is that possible? How much more complicated would that be via with the the thing? Like, what is is that, or does someone need to be there physically to be hosting the show? Well, you got to test it out with us one of these days, Jeff. You got you got to test it. You know, I'll be <laughs> I'll be Huckleberry. I'll be the guinea pig. I, I don't mind throwing a green screen and, and getting getting in there and and All taking right. a shot. So. Okay, so I'll answer that. Um, so uh, Kevin Martin was our former host. The guy's a beast. I uh, got nothing but love for for Kevin, and he's crushing on Twitch right now. But he, for about a year, was was our was our host during our beta games and stuff. And um, what happened is during the pandemic, basically March, April through like June or July of last year, is we couldn't come in studio. It was basically like like in Canada, you were not allowed to basically go into offices. You had to find a way to work from home. So he basically took the green screen, took the camera. Uh, took everything into his house, his apartment, had his girlfriend, Peely, who's amazing as well, too. She was doing on Stream Deck and pressing the OBS assets and things like this. And uh, and so we actually did it remotely within the same town during COVID. So we've already figured it out. Um, we know that it can be done. Um, you know, it, there's definitely risks involved with it. Like, we got to make sure their internet's really good and and uh, all this these different things. But um Besides that, if they have a great camera, a green screen, good internet, it's doable. For sure. We got a question, Ethereum or Bitcoin? Or either, I guess. Uh, Bitcoin. I'm going Bitcoin. Um, 
Are you going to watch Euros 2021? Are you a soccer fan? What sports do you like? There was a sports question as well. Do you play sports or watch sports? I, I play just about every, every sport. Um, I was uh, played soccer for, for 10 years, uh, but I, don't, I think you'd kick my butt on the, on the soccer field. Uh, but besides that, I, I yeah, you're going to say? I say I hope so. I mean, I play. I mean, if you could beat me, I, I would. There'd be a problem. I think. I mean, I, that was sort of like my. That was basically like my twenty plus year. You know I what it. I did a lot. But I get. Who knows now, right? Anything. We're yeah. we're, we're uh, been out the door. But you play. You play a bit of soccer too. What about the World yeah. Series, World Cup of Vegas, and and would you do that now? I, if you came I would love to do that. Yeah, I would love to. I see. I've seen videos of you guys playing it, and I think it's super cool. I, I would love to do it at some point. Um, but uh, but yeah, my my main sports were um were golf i played basically everything but golf hockey baseball basketball volleyball um my probably what i excel at the most is um golf and maybe not even on there because i've really struggled lately but uh um volleyball was one of my best um you know hockey i was pretty i was pretty decent at um anyone wants to play a ping pong match versus me ever like uh you're in some some trouble for sure but i'll, I'll compete again in anything I, I absolutely love competition i love sports i'm i'm down to do it anytime love it last question here about the app being available in other countries could you talk a little about restrictions um you mentioned this earlier that you it's sort of able to be turned on or you know whatnot and, and what learning yeah. have you had because again when you start the company when you when you're when you say this idea it's an idea on paper you know, oh, this is cool. Let's get some developers. How what how crazy could it be? But then you go into like, all right, it's it's Google, it's apps, it's it's iPhone. There's different I you know I took like different stores, different regions, different restrictions. How complicated is that? And what what about other countries and areas? Like, what is the kind of rollout or plan? And and what does that currently uh, entail? Maybe hit me both sides. What's coming? Yeah. How was that process to learn? And are you surprised by that? Yeah, totally surprised by it. Um, all the different like facets that go into each thing and, and making sure that uh, a, something is like 100% ready or 99.8% ready before you actually release it to the public. Because, you know, you start seeing, you know, a flush beat a full house once or twice. and You're like, I'm never playing this thing again. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, so just making sure that like all the little facets are are there and, and doing that you know, within the app and then, you know, launching on iOS, launching on Android, like we're, we're ready to go on Android right now, but we're dealing with some Google play red tape. Uh, I think I've seen some, some email notifications that have come in. So maybe things are starting to, maybe some wheels are starting to turn, maybe some wheels are starting to turn there. Um, so hopefully Android very soon, as far as other countries go and stuff. Um, one of our hosts, uh, our hosts are amazing, by the way, Danny, Natalie, Rodrigo, um, Rodrigo has got a huge following in Brazil. He basically used to be like a you know, kind of like a, a Brazil pop star uh, in many ways. He was uh, in Mexico, he, which he lived a good chunk of his life. He was, he was basically like a, a host for the MTV of Mexico as well. So a massive following in Brazil specifically. So um, uh, we really are looking forward to go, go to Brazil at some point. Um, really want to go to the UK. We've got a ton of people over there that want to play it. Um, so, you know, Australia, like it eventually we'll go, we'll look to go worldwide. And the great thing of what we've done with our app is that it is available to be able to do that. It's like we don't, we're not gambling. So it's, it's, it's something that people can play and win real money from all over the place. Um, but you know, we just gotta, we gotta take these things in stride. You know what I mean? Gotta take them one step at a time. And, uh, right now the step we're in is, is North America. Really cool. Really interesting. It's uh, it really is cool to see this whole project come together and, and be involved in some capacity, talking with you, watching the, the struggles, the hurdles, the triumphs. And, you know, again, where I think it's uh, it's sort of like golf, in my opinion, too, it's just like poker, where golf, it's hard to get, you know, to get to 120 or like be able to go down to like 100 shooting. Not that not that crazy on the 90. But then once you start, once you get something, a, a fine tuned sort of swing or stroke or thing, like how do you now get it? How do you get from 1100 to 1200 users? to 15 on 2000, like these things are very difficult. Take a lot yeah. of thought, a lot of time, a lot of attention, a lot of teamwork, a lot of also luck as well. Um, and, and that's kind of like the, uh, the hurdle now, but I guess like also the hardest part is to put that initial kind of push and make the decision to go for it. And then once you're there, it's kind of like, all right, you're pot committed. I'm in, I'm going yeah. for it. We're going to, we're going to do whatever it takes. So, you know, it's an exciting sweat. It's a very, very cool concept, very fun. You know, it's like, again, recreational all the way up to, uh, experts. It's kind of nice for a player that's like, would consider himself a professional, even like I'll take myself where I know how to play poker. I like playing poker. Um, it's a, it's just like, it's relaxing, just swipe, you know, all in her fold. It's fun. It's like some luck too. And it's just like, all right, this is cool and relaxing and let me get in there. But then someone who doesn't really know much, they can't get taken advantage of. It's a free roll. 
they're they're at the elite level playing field and they get to kind of look at some board textures and even be like you know figure out if it's good to go on or fold so it, it's uh it's pretty cool um i I'm, I'm definitely excited and happy how it's gone so far and and look forward to uh to the journey continue what about plo do you play plo and is plo a version we could run here could we mix in some plo or is the software yeah. not in there yet because that's i've been thinking about that lately and uh and Joey Ingram has been part of the team as well, as well too, which is awesome. The guy's a beast and him and I are strategizing all the time, which is, which is great. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, he always talks about the great game of Parliament Omaha. And uh, so we, we've definitely, you know, been thinking about how we could make a, a, a Parliament Omaha version of, of cash live as well too. And I, I don't think that it would actually take away that many players. Like obviously like Parliament Omaha has much less, uh, you know, there's much smaller audience that basically plays PLO versus Hold'em, but at the same time, like our game's super fun, and 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 you know, with that one decision to be made, I think there's a lot of variations that we can do. There, there's uh, you know, get dealt four cards, pick only two. You know what I mean? Um, things things like that, or get dealt three cards, pick only two. Um, you know, uh, different and play all four and all the different you know combinations that can be happening and things like this like i i do think that's definitely in our in our pipeline i don't know if it'll i don't think it'll happen in 2021 but uh you know maybe 2022 very very interesting i i i love that i love to hear that that's good in here that's on the horizon so i uh, i love it we are all wrapped up here other than the most exciting fun part who doesn't love to win prizes we're gonna give away a 55 dollar party poker ticket so i'm gonna go here i'm gonna copy this link. This is I'm rusty. I haven't bound podcast to stream in a couple weeks. I'm I'm a father now, part-time podcaster streamer, but let's see if we can get this to work here. Uh let's paste it in. I think this should work. This is a very nice tool from DMP3. It's a chance that this is expired or isn't isn't logging, but Matt, I'm gonna let you ultimately say when. Let me see if this is loading so far. So good. We're creating a contest. Good luck to everyone who entered. I am sure. Let me see if this is gonna do it right. I think we're 50-50, honestly. Let me down oh. cross your fingers. Retweets, count of tweet. It looks like it's done. Seventy-eight are eligible, yeah. so greater than one percent chance to win. This is not. This is this is a decent shot. It looks like it's working. All right, this worked. Eighty-three retweets. They screened a couple bots. This is a high-end uh, retweet picker. And uh, Matt, we're gonna let you choose a winner. You tell me when. Now. Now has been called, so I still had to do this. I am sure we're picking a winner. Fifty-five dollar ticket, courtesy of Matt, myself, Party Poker Nemesis. Seven, I saw him. He's been here. He's in the mix. He's asking questions. There's Escalante. Nice. He's got a poker player. He's got his daughters. You can relate. Oh, you got two it. daughters. Two daughters myself too, Nemesis. I love it. What a what a bank. Uh, congrats. I'm going to give him a message. Uh, 55 tickets. And what is your party poker username? Let's do that. And I love uh, yeah, that's amazing. So beautiful, beautiful. Matt, thank you so much. I am going to send a, a raid i gotta figure out how to do this man i'm rusty hold on raid party poker tv guys say hi jamie and monia are battling heads up on party poker tv i'm gonna send the, the raid matt will be in touch of course thank you for coming on man this was a, a treat and uh, again guys play cash live there's a website there's an exclamation cash live in the chat i appreciate all you guys stopping by uh pie gal matt green eyed asian we're gonna put that in as a, as a uh as a suggestion look at the man's in the chat you gotta respect that he's actually live in the chat watching the, the podcast live. He wins the ticket. He wins. I the love it. Ticket. He asked a great question. I mean, it's just girl, dad, two girls. It's all energy is powerful. We were talking about a clear intention, write stuff on your hand, put it out loud. It can happen. Why not me? Why not us? Why not cash live? Matt, thank you so much, man. Anything else? You want any parting words? I'm about to send the raid. Dude, you're a beast, JG. I, I love, uh, love working with you the last couple of years. And uh, yeah, it's been so much fun. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Everyone check out Cash Live and uh, keep following everything that Jeff does too. The guy's a, a beast. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate you. And again, I am I am definitely I'm definitely excited. I think you got something here. I think you got something uh, something absolutely special. And we are gonna we're gonna just we're gonna keep going, man. And I, I look forward to being able to support. And again, I did send you a note while we were live here. And I want you to remind me on that plus some other things. Actually, if you want to call me real quick, we can get off just so it's fresh in the head because we gotta we gotta. We got to make moves. We can't, we can't, uh, we got, we got to, we got to, we got to crush it. What do you think? What's your, what's your vote on this about um, what, what do you think is the answer people would choose the November nine or the five, six, K five, 900 K score. What do you think the percentage will be? Oh man. Uh, right off the top of my head, I'd say November nine, 55, 45. 
I gotta believe the bracelet's 60 40, but we'll we'll see. We can bet a dinner on it if you want. We can bet a dinner. Yeah, let's bet dinner on it. Let's bet who's ever closer on that. We'll bet dinner on it. It's booked. So cheers, man. Guys, say hi to Party Poker TV. Matt Staples also streaming. And uh, enjoy this on all the audio outlets. If you didn't get to catch it all, you can go back and watch it or on YouTube. Uh, we'll we'll see Matt soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys.